So welcome everyone to our July SAGE seminar series 2021. Uh, we're online. I'm also in a in a seminar room, but there is no one here, so but that's fine. And um, we are pleased to welcome you today to our um, July seminar series. Uh, my name is Adele Pavlidis and I am the research seminar series convener of the Sport and Gender Equity Group at Griffith. I just wanted to start with an acknowledgement of country. We do this every time we have a seminar, but it's particularly important this week as it's NADOC week. So um, yeah, Griffith University and myself acknowledges the traditional custodians on the land on which we're meeting and pays respect to the elders past and present and extends that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So I'm on the Gold Coast here, the Kumbaberry people and the Yamambere people here is the land that I work on um, and I'm very grateful to be here. Just some general housekeeping as we, we're all used to this now but uh, please keep your microphone on mute so we can avoid background noise. There will be time for questions at the end. Uh, please use the chat and I will be moderating. Uh, Damien will also be keeping an eye on that. We may not get around to all questions. You can also put your hand up, use that feature or even unmute yourself at that point um, uh, if you want to join in and there seems to be a gap. Um, please use respectful and inclusive language so abuse will not be tolerated. Because yeah, Even though we're online, still doesn't mean that we can be uncivil. Um, please follow us on Twitter and feel free to follow along on Twitter. Our hash, we're at Griffith Uni Sage and you can use whatever hashtag you like. So, um, all right, so I will now hand over. I'll just do a, a brief introduction to our wonderful speakers who I'm really excited to learn from. And, you know, Catherine and I have been in touch now for a few years and it's just been it's just so great to see the growing momentum around gender equity in Australia and the research we're doing with, uh, you know, sport integrity and gender equity, pay equity and all the different social cultural issues. So I'm really excited to be part of something bigger than just at Griffith. And I'm really um, glad that we can do this together. So uh, the, paper, the title of their paper is Gender Equity in the Australian Football League, The Challenge for Hannah Mousey. And we have Catherine Ordway, Dr. Catherine Ordway, who's an assistant professor at the University of Canberra. She has had a long professional association with a range of sports as a consultant, a director, a tribunal member, a mentor, a legal advisor, and as a researcher. Uh, she's also had a recent book uh, published, which uh, you know would be really important. I think her slide has that at the back. Um, we have Dr. Matt Nicol, who's a lecturer at the School of Business and Law at Central University, Central Queensland University. His research focuses on labor mobility, labor regulation and wages in professional baseball in the United States and Japan. And he's also recently researched free agency and corporate governance in the Australian Football League. And then we have Damien Parry, who's a graduate with a MA in sport ethics and integrity and a joint master's program funded by the European Union. Um, as a Eras Erasmus Mundus scholarship holder, he had the opportunity to study across four partner universities and has completed his thesis regarding transgender inclusion in sport. So it's wonderful to have that expertise. I will stop sharing now and hand over and really look forward to learning and listening. Thank you so much, Adele. And thank you everyone for joining us today to have um, part of this conversation continue and it's really wonderful for us to have an opportunity to share our ideas with you and to hopefully get some ideas back also um, from the various sports and the various organisations that you come to this um, topic on. We wanted to um, just give you an outline from our different perspective. You heard from Adele saying that um, Matt and I uh, coming from this from a legal lens and Damien is a philosopher I think it's fair to say and uh, I, I should have just also mentioned that Damien and I today are sitting on Ngunnawal land so we send our greetings from from there. So we wanted to just go through and and I'm going to talk about the inspiration for this topic and and how I came to start thinking about it um, and then we'll move to Matt and he will update you on where the policies are at at the moment 
Um, and then Damien is going to talk a bit about his um, PhD study. So he's morphed from his master's study into PhD now, into fairness and inclusion, and then we'll wrap it all up on where to from here and invite questions and discussion after that. So please put any questions into the chat as Adele mentioned, and, and we'll go through from there. So I'm just gonna share my slides. And there we go. So the starting point for me is to think about vulnerable people and vulnerable athletes. And um, as you can see there on the dot points, transgender people are some of the most marginalized people in our community. And marginalized groups of people are at greater risk of mental health issues. And sport can play a really important role in including people and making them part of a community. And, and from my perspective, my work is in sport integrity and I'm interested to know how we can support vulnerable people better because they, of course, pose a really serious risk to the integrity of sport, not just through match fixing and doping, but in other um, fraud and corruption areas as well, potentially. So I, I'm thinking about it from an inclusive perspective, but also from an integrity perspective. So I also wanted to... Um, have disclosure. I know Hannah and my background is handball and uh, I my handball career predates Hannah's by quite a long way um, but I knew Hannah before she transitioned. So I have followed her journey through her handball uh, and getting permission through the International Olympic Committee rules and then the International Handball Federation rules in order to permit her to play handball. And she continues to play handball. In fact, she uh, represented Canberra two weeks ago at the club championships in the Gold Coast. And, and yay, Canberra, we had a win. So that's wonderful. So um, Hannah has struggled since transition to, to do basic things like get a job and and to rent a house and has suffered all kinds of different discrimination. And with the introduction of the AFLW, this gave an opportunity to Hannah to be able to earn a living because you would appreciate that handball is a fairly small sport in Australia. And while there are professional leagues in Europe and so on, um, it's much easier to to be able to earn a living in the professional codes here in Australia, particularly when if, if you're a person who's going through transition, you want to be close to family and going overseas to work in a new league um, and play in a new in a league in Germany or Denmark or whatever is not really an option. So the AFLW presented a really wonderful opportunity for Hannah. And so she pursued the, the opportunity to play in, first of all, in Canberra. And she played for a couple of seasons here and there weren't any issues. There weren't, um, I've seen media reports and I've spoken to people who have played with Hannah and against Hannah and there were no issues at all. The coach was very happy. Her skill, of course, was, um, is, was on a trajectory because she was learning a new sport and it's difficult to go from one sport to another, uh, as we've seen many athletes try to do over the years and it takes a little bit of time to learn a new sport um, but there were certainly no injury issues there were no objections um, and even uh, in handball there even though it's quite a conservative sport there on the whole people were very supportive of Hannah's um, transition into the women's side of the game. So I was interested then when she applied to go into the AFLW why that became objectionable. And even though she had satisfied the rules from the International Olympic Committee, of course, even though the AFL is effectively an international federation in its own right, um, it doesn't have to comply with the International Olympic Committee rules. It's not part of the Olympic program. Um, but they took exception to her applying uh, to be part of the AFLW. And there were claims about whether she presented an unfair advantage, whether there was an increased risk of injury to other players. And, and I thought that actually perhaps the issue was more about whether it was a, an image issue for the AFLW. At the time of the launch of the AFLW, maybe you remember that the, the star player, Moana, um, was asked to cover up her tattoos and so on, and there was a bit of uh, controversy around that. So I thought, mm, is this an image issue or are there other things at play? So I started to think about that and say, well, um, who are um, the, the women that represent us at the moment in other sports? 
and what is the variability looking like in terms of how we define women. And if we think about our, our tiny gymnasts all the way up to, you can see there, our netballers and basketballers, rugby league players who represent us, then we have a really diverse span of um, heights, weights, physicality. And if we had um, a player like Liz Cambridge or Caitlin Bassett playing in the AFLW, would that present any issues for us? I thought about, too, the diversity in teams um, and looked at some research in handball and looked at 14-year-old girls and their variation in, and you can see their body um, height, mass, arm span, palm opening, broad jumps. Like, how do you measure what is um, within the span of uh, a normal woman, a 14-year-old woman, this research was, and it's quite broad. So... I was wondering about um, what integrity means for an organisation too. And I thought about the AFL's um, stance on um, same-sex marriage, where they were very um, supportive. And you can see there the photograph for yes. And also there were um, lots of conversations about the AFL's position on racism and their response in relation to Adam Goods. And I thought, how does this all play in? If what you say... Is, is not what you're doing. When in Hannah's case, the um, AFL decided to use the Victorian anti-discrimination legislation to exclude Hannah on the grounds of strength, stamina, stamina and physique. And I wondered how do you measure those things and are the other AFLW players measured in this way? And in fact, are the AFLM players measured in this way? So I went online to see what was in place for the, the current then reigning um, Richmond Premiership team. And in the difference in height within that one team was 30 centimetres. And the difference in weight, you can see there, is 35 kilos. And I thought, well, that's very fascinating because that's actually what's wonderful about teams. Team sports uh, that are successful have great diversity within them. So why isn't there room then for a transgender woman to play in the AFLW if what we want to see is diversity? Why wouldn't we start with a position of yes and then see if there are any issues that come out from there? So the kinds of issues then that we were thinking about, and I'll, I'll give it over next to Matt to think, to discuss how the policies have shaped this, but the kinds of discussions that were taking place around this topic is, is there a difference for transgender athletes being allowed to play at community level sport? Do we have any issue with that? Is it only once they get it, get to the elite level? And, and something that Damien will talk about is, is to, um, is it, are we only interested once transgender women start to win? Can they ever, can they ever win? Is there any consistency here between the state and the national competitions? Because Hannah, of course, was allowed to play in the ACT competition and then ultimately the Victorian Football League, but wasn't allowed to play at the AFLW level where you would think that the players would be so much stronger and bigger and more experienced so that there wouldn't be the issues around unfair advantage or, or potential um, injury and duty of care. Then I wondered if there was a difference between the timing for when an athlete transitioned, when they were a child, and we're increasingly seeing that in the community now where there's transitioning happening earlier and earlier, and does it matter then from a scientific point of view or a legal point of view, whether it's when they're an adult. Then I also wondered about the, the unfair advantage idea um, in team and individual sports because um, Scientifically, it's very difficult to get enough data because there just aren't enough transgender athletes out there. And how do you compare a transgender athlete who is in cycling as against weightlifting, as against handball or basketball or golf or any of those other sports? Uh, you can't just put a blanket over all of them when you're thinking about um, protecting the binary sport um, women's category. So I'll hand over now to Matt to talk about then after those discussions and consultations with the sports industry, where that ended up in 2019. No worries. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, just one thing to double check, Catherine, how are you moving between your slides? 
Oh, you're on mute. I'm just flicking it here on my screen so I can, oh, can. do that for you. So you let me know when you're ready. Oh, lovely. That is fantastic. Um, thanks, Catherine. So my, uh, my background, as was mentioned, is that I'm uh, a baseball person, but in particular, I focus on labour regulation and labour mobility and, uh, and some other things like corporate governance and more recently with Catherine's book, uh, Integrity. And so in terms of... Um, Catherine's last slide, the, the, the one thing I think that is important to frame in terms of regulation and approaches to regulation is that all those issues Catherine mentioned are really complex to regulate and to govern and that they're evolving. And, and the couple of slides that I'll go through and, and what our paper is is developing into is, is how these policies evolve uh, and in a fairly short period of time as well. So a number of the issues that Catherine mentioned in her last slide uh, have come out in the AFLW uh, policy, oh, sorry, the AFL gender uh, diversity policy in 2020. But I'll get to that in, in a minute. So uh, essentially what, what happened was after Hannah Mouncey attempted to uh, nominate for the AFLW draft in uh, 27 and 2018, uh, a number of the major professional sports through the coalition of the organization of major professional and participation sports and sports uh, Australia basically asked for guidance on how to comply with their legal obligations uh, and what um, what they need to do to ensure that they have inclusive sport. And so essentially uh, what happened was in 2019, the Australian Human Rights Commission uh, produced what is essentially the Sport Australia's policy for inclusion and gender uh, diversity uh, through their guidelines for the inclusion of transgender and gender diverse people in sport. And so that sets the, the basic uh, framework for governance um, uh, in terms of uh, gender diverse people and transgender people in sport. And so I'll just go through the, the, the basic features of it. It's fairly uh, brief for those of you that are, are not lawyers. It's not a long document. There's five sections and there's some additional resources. So it's it's quite easy to, to use. What I should point out from a, a legal point of view is that they are guidelines. So in terms of the uh, legal effect of these uh, guidelines, th there isn't a lot really. Uh, in terms of compliance or non-compliance and enforcement for breaches of, of any of these uh, guidelines, they're, they're, they're not really uh, enforceable uh, per se. So they're really uh, designed to provide guidance to individual sports, um, leagues, uh, clubs, uh, uh, committee members, coaches and, and these types of people to ensure that they have a, an inclusive, uh, inclusive sport. And so the, the guidelines basically have four underlying human rights principles and they are equality, uh, participation in sport, freedom from discrimination and harassment and privacy. And the one thing that I'll, I would point out that these principles touch on but don't expressly state is uh, a, a key thing that we're focusing on in our paper. And that is that in terms of global sports law, and Catherine and I will advocate that there is global sports law, uh, but in terms of what is deemed to be global sports law, there is an international uh, human right to uh, participate and be involved in sport. And that doesn't distinguish between uh, elite sport or community sport, it's, it's uh, just sport. And so that is established in the IOC charter and it's also uh, established in the UNESCO uh, International Charter on Physical Education and Sport. And so, as Catherine mentioned, even though the AFL is not part of the uh, Olympic family, through global sports law and through UNESCO, UNESCO's uh, charter, uh, you, there's a, a, a fairly strong argument to say that that, that uh, encompasses what um, uh, the AFL does and that they have an obligation to to uh, to uh, ensure that that is a, a, a right that's met by anyone that wants to play uh, Australian rules football. And so after 2019, uh, play by the rules uh, uh, furthered and developed those four underlying principles uh, through their seven pillars of inclusion. So they sort of break down those um, uh, human rights into uh, actual inclusion policies in terms of access, attitude, choice, partnerships, communication policy and opportunities. And there's basically uh, two key aspects uh, 
uh, of, uh, of the of this policy. The first one is essentially it, it sets out how sports organisations can comply uh, with uh, the relevant uh, provisions in Sex Discrimination Act in terms of uh, relevant areas to inclusion uh, and specifically uh, lawful, or, and I should point out there is lawful and unlawful uh, discrimination based on sex uh, or gender identity. And then it also deals with sexual harassment, victimisation and liability in terms of who's liable for, for breaches of the Sex Discrimination Act, which I should point out is uh, federal law and there is similar uh, state law uh, as well. And so uh, that, that's kind of interesting because depending on how cynical you are, and I, I might be too cynical with these things, it, it can be a way to ensure that you comply with your legal obligations if you want to discriminate but it can also promote uh, 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 sound legal practice as well as uh, uh, good practice in terms of inclusion and treating everyone uh, equally. So um, that's, that's the key thing with the Sex Discrimination Act. The one thing that Catherine mentioned was the Victorian Equal Opportunity Act. And the Victorian Equal Opportunity Opportunity Act and the Sex Discrimination Act both have a sports exemption, which allows lawful discrimination based on sex or gender identity in, in a limited situation. So this is very important because as I'll look at in the next uh, uh, couple of slides, essentially the AFL policy to a large degree is based on complying and, and meeting the requirements of the Victorian uh, sports exemption, which basically allows uh, discrimination on the basis of sex or gender identity in a competitive sporting event. So that's the, the threshold uh, test of the first requirement uh, in which strength, stamina or physique of competitors is relevant. Okay, so that's how we it ties into uh, gender diverse uh, and transgender uh, athletes. And then there's also some practical guidance. Um, and on my, I may have crammed too much on, onto uh, this slide as I tend to do, uh, but basically uh, it, there's uh, guidance on, on on what sporting clubs, which being involved in uh, the administration of baseball in Melbourne and Victoria is really important. It gives uh, clubs and leagues uh, guidance on how to actually comply with these things, such as leadership, having appropriate policies, um, codes of conduct, uniforms, these types of things, which um, if, again, knowing uh, community sport, these types of uh, guidance are, are really useful. Catherine, if you could click over for me, that would be great, please. So in terms of um, the, AFLW, uh, the AFL policy on gender diversity, the, the key thing to point out is that from 2020, the AFL uh, uh, created uh, two formal policies. So uh, prior to 2020, there was just one uh, gender diversity policy and inclusion policy. Uh, and then from 2020, you have a, a policy for community football and a policy for elite football, which also includes elite pathways. So uh, elite football is essentially the AFLW and then elite pathway uh, programs, uh, second tier state competitions, which as Catherine mentioned, uh, Hannah uh, participated in in Canberra prior to, and, and, and has now, uh, prior to the, uh, the 2020 policy. She's also uh, wanting to play in it or was wanting to play in it earlier this year. I'm not sure where that uh, stands because she was governed by this new policy. Uh, and the other point um, uh, that I was going to make uh, is that there are a couple of key differences, and I just want to flag those before I go through the, 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 the two different policies. But essentially, uh, in addition to competitive advantage, which really focuses on AFLW and elite, uh, and elite pathway programs, the, the first requirement is that uh, athletes don't pose a safety risk uh, transgender athletes and gender diverse athletes don't pose a safety risk that applies to community football uh, eligibility as well as uh, elite football. The, that ties into another requirement is that you have to be eligible as a transgender uh, athlete and a uh, gender diverse athlete to actually play in, in these competitions. It's not a given right that if I want to play in the local baseball league or local football league, I can do that. Uh, I have to meet as a, as a transgender uh, athlete or a gender diverse athlete, uh, certain requirements that I'll go through in a minute. And then the other key point of difference between the, the community football policy and the uh, elite uh, uh, policy is that um, 
eligibility requirements for the elite policy uh, includes competitive advantage, which as Catherine mentioned, focuses on strength, stamina and physique. So they're the, 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 that's the basic overview. In terms of participation in community football, uh, the basic eligibility is that trans women, trans men and non-binary people can compete in the football competition that accords with their identified gender. So um, that's the, the, the basic right. And then there's a couple of requirements there. Um, the first one is that you comply with all applicable rules of the competition. And in the rule in the policy, it states including the Australian football anti-doping code. And, and the reason why I kept that in there, I think it's important just to flag um, that this taps into the testosterone issue. Okay, so this is really important from an anti-doping perspective, uh, the eligibility of gender diverse people to compete in, um, in, in uh, sport, more so elite sport, but also um, uh, the, 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 there are requirements uh, for uh, community uh, sport, not just football, but I know in baseball as well in Melbourne, that um, th this taps into uh, anti-doping uh, requirements. And then where a governing uh, league refers a player to the AFL Gender Diversity Policy Committee, uh, the committee must act reasonably and be satisfied that unacceptable safety risks do not arise from the person's proposed or continued participation in the competition. So if there is a referral, then basically uh, the process is that there needs to be a risk assessment that considers whether or not there's unacceptable safety risks um, that only arise in exceptional circumstances, not just through the, the, the player's participation. Uh, is there a significant disparity between the player's physique compared to cisgender players? And can the rules of the community competition manage the relevant risks? And then I've just got there that, that you may not be able to see that there's limited grounds of appeal to the AFL legal counsel. And so in terms of uh, these um, first two points, I would just ask you to consider the, those points that Catherine made. Okay, so th these uh, types of uh, issues with safety risk and disparity between uh, players' physique, that exists in all sport. Okay, so and that exists in, in, in the AFL men's. You, know, you have people like Buddy Franklin competing against uh, a small on baller. And I apologise to people that aren't from Melbourne, but I, I, I don't have a comparison for rugby. I'm not a rugby person. But you, you, you get that uh, disparity in baseball. You have pitchers that are six foot 10 and throw 100 miles an hour to uh, uh, players. Uh, there's a guy at Houston Astros who's five foot six. He is a very good hitter, but there's still that disparity in strength and physique. So this is, I think, is important from a safety risk in uh, contact sports. I think this is a, an important thing that you can consider not just with uh, transgender women and uh, uh, cis uh, and sorry, um, uh, gender diverse women, but how does this compare to other sports? How does this compare to other athletes in in uh, in, in women's football as well? Uh, and so that's the basis for the community football uh, policy. And Catherine, if you could just switch over, please. And so then we have the elite football uh, competition. And so the safety and eligibility requirements are, are fairly similar. It just includes the, a, a formal risk assessment. Um, so there's the safety uh, requirement in terms of being el eligible uh, to play in elite football if you're gender diverse or trans uh, woman. And so again, this only applies to trans women and uh, gender diverse women, uh, uh, sorry, non-binary women. And I'm still getting my head around terminology. So I apologize if I don't get some of this terminology 100% uh, uh, correct. But this does not apply to uh, trans men or, or non-binary men playing in a men's competition. Okay, so this is a, a very important thing to uh, identify. And, and you know, there's a possibility that that's discriminatory. Uh, in terms of uh, legislation. And so uh, basically, if you meet those requirements, uh, you can uh, get, a, a, you have to uh, apply to and receive approval from the AFL to play in women's elite and elite pathway competitions. Another key difference, there's a couple of uh, exemptions uh, um, which I can um, share with people if, uh, later if, if we've got time, but um, Essentially, what this means is that a, a trans woman and a non-binary uh, woman, a gender diverse woman, has to apply to seek approval to play in a women's competition. Now, to me, there's, there's an element of the AFL then determining who is a woman. 
what constitutes being a woman. And so I think that's a really important thing to consider as to whether or not we want sports governing bodies making that decision, if they have the, the, the right to make that decision. Uh, and particularly with the AFL, as Catherine mentioned, they are essentially the, the international governing body for this sport. Okay, so I would argue that the, uh, the, the governance uh, threshold, um, the expectations of the AFL should be higher than some other sports governing bodies uh, that aren't at the apex of the governance structure. And then essentially, um, in terms of making an application, uh, and this was more or less the same in 2017 and 2018 when uh, Hannah uh, nominated for the draft and then uh, withdrew her nomination for the 2018 draft, is that she needs to supply uh, medical records to establish the maintenance of the total testosterone level in serum of less than five, I think it's at nanomills, I'm also not a scientist, so I apologise, uh, for a minimum of 24 months prior to the application, a medical record from their treating medical practitioner, which states the maintenance of their testosterone levels for the 20 months prior to their application, and then data related to height, weight, um, bench press, squat, 20 metre sprint, vertical jump, uh, raw, sorry, that should be GPS, um, match data from three Australian football games and a two kilometre run. Uh, and so basically the uh, committee uh, is composed of members uh, with experience in high performance, women's football operations, inclusion and social policy, risk, legal, medical and mental health and anti-doping. And they basically make an assessment as to whether or not that the, the player um, is, uh, is, is eligible based on uh, the medical reports and that data. Uh, in terms of the, 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 the data, uh, essentially what this is tapping into is competitive advantage as well as safety. Uh, and, and I should point out that, that safety applies at, at community level in terms of um, uh, liability, uh, the, uh, tort law, different legislative regimes. When you're looking at elite football, it, it may, at least with the AFLW, tap into occupational health and safety uh, law as well. And Eric Winholtz has uh, published an interesting paper on the AFLW um, this year, I think, um, on this uh, particular issue from an occupational health and safety uh, perspective. Uh, and so in terms of um, competitive advantage, that, that's just something I want to have a, a, a brief chat about in the, the next slide. So Catherine, you could... Uh, switch over. And I should point out that the, that the grounds for appeal uh, does not really exist for elite football competitions. Essentially what happens there is that the AFL and in the policy, it doesn't say if it's the CEO or the, um, uh, the AFL commission or someone else within the AFL, uh, but they can basically, if they decide uh, and they can do this at their own discretion, they can refer any decision made by the committee back to the committee to review. And so in terms of the, uh, some of the limitations on the AFL uh, policy, the, the first one is that you've got separate policies for community and elite football. Um, the, the, the international human rights laws on the right to participate in football doesn't distinguish between a right to play club football in my local area is Essendon, as opposed to the Essendon Football Club in the AFL. There's no distinction based on um, the, the uh, type of sport, the level of sport. It's a right to, to participate in sport. So that would be the, the, the first um, uh, issue that, that I would raise. Uh, safe health and safety can be dealt with under uh, separate legislative issues if that exists. But again, then you're getting into uh, equity discrimination issues in that that needs to be applied uh, to all sports, uh, or to all uh, competitions, uh, men's and women's. Uh, the eligibility criteria, um, I've been tapping into the, the scientific data on testosterone and it's undecided in relation to whether or not there is a competitive advantage um, for uh, uh, gender diverse and uh, transgender uh, uh, women. And the other point is, is that there's very little data on, um, on any competitive advantage that athletic trans uh, women have, uh, have uh, retained. So I think that's really important. I think Damien's gonna mention this a little bit. Um, equity, as I mentioned, you know, safety applies to all requirements. I'll just go back to the eligibility criteria briefly. There is a level of subjectivity there in terms of bench press. Um, you know, I know when um, my brother played in the AFL in the 1990s, you know, bench press was really, really important, but there are other ways to measure strength uh, as well. 
Um, and so in terms of uh, strength and physique, you know, uh, the modern uh, strength and conditioning and training has really, you know, had big impact across athletes at, at, at uh, in all, all sports, men and, and women. Um, there's some transparency issues in terms of the uh, Gender Diversity Policy Committee, uh, their members, um, who they are. I, couldn't find that, that was difficult to locate, um, what their uh, education, their professional background are, um, decision-making process, uh, the rationale uh, with Hannah Mouncey's um, uh, nomination being rejected was not um, announced. And even with the decision under the, the new policy for elite players is confidential. So there's no disclosure to anyone outside the, the player. Um, competitive advantage, um, I think one of the issues from a legal perspective is that um, the, with transgender athletes and gender diverse athletes, the focus is on um, competitive advantage as opposed to unfair competitive advantage and regulating competitive advantage. You know, where, where, where do you start with that? I mean, that, that's, you know, I think this opens up a, a really complex set of issues um, and, and governance. Um, you know, do you draw the line with uh, resources? Uh, training uh, resources, uh, access to additional coaching, um, you know, the level of coaching, um, you know, you, 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 your mother or father played elite sport, um, you know, you, there's advantages there. So it becomes um, very, uh, very difficult. Um, not to say it's not un uh, governable, but it's, it's just a really complex area. And then um, th there is also a lack of uh, uh, oversight by an external or independent body uh, for an appeal, which I would suggest the Australian Human Rights Commission or Victorian Equal Opportunity Commission would be an appropriate body potentially. And I'll hand over to Damien now. There you go, Damien, just bring up your slide. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, while Catherine does that, I just want to, I'm just, I've got the chat open as well. So I'm just following on the, the chat and there's a couple of uh, very good questions uh, in there at the moment, which I could probably address in part now. Um, Heather's, uh, Heather is, uh, has uh, asked, uh, who determines if the player is a woman? Surely it's the individual player and not the governing body. Um, that's a statement, a statement that I certainly could agree with, but sport has taken it upon themselves to define what uh, uh, what some of the requirements of the female category is, and um, and that has uh, played uh, played the role of of determining uh, determining who is woman enough. Um, and sport has been doing that for many many years. We've had gender testing in sport since since the uh, uh, since uh, post World War Two in the nineteen forties and fifties. Um, uh, but uh, at, at this point in time, um, sport uh, has chosen to define what transition is for sport purposes uh, for trans women, um, and um, uh, we can certainly. Uh, certainly argue as as to whether or not there is a scientific basis for that rule at the moment um, whether or not that rule is is a very blunt instrument in in determining who is woman enough um, uh, and the like but um, there I, I, I tend to separate the arguments as to what the rule is in terms of inclusion in in the female category uh, and de uh, determining okay we have a rule uh, and uh, then we, fo we follow that rule. So I, I tend to separate those, those two arguments out. And um, so just moving, moving on. Um, so uh, my PhD topic is of course, um, uh, inclusion and fairness dichotomy in sports. So what we've seen with the case of, of uh, Hannah Mouncey and other trans uh, women athletes is this tension between their inclusion in sport, their human right to be included in sport, uh, and um, the perceptions of what is fair and fairness uh, in in sport. Um, as Catherine mentioned, I come from uh, a philo uh, philosophical uh, background, uh, thanks to my time at the um, on the uh, the Macy program over in Europe. It's a very European. Uh, sort of uh, focus. It's not something that that we've seen very often uh, in uh, Australia. But um, I, what I I see is international sporting federations making 
rules because something has become an issue. Uh, and those rules don't tend to be based in any sort of ethical, philosophical, uh, philosophical sphere. And I, th I think I think it's imp important that if we are going to make rules which govern uh, who can be involved in certain sports and how they're involved in sports, I think I think it's important that that comes from from a a, 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 a at least a, a starting an ethical starting point instead of instead of the 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 uh, we need to fix a problem um just um uh, and i don't uh, uh so trans women uh would be um uh, one aspect of my phd but there's also the issue of uh, trans men there's the issue of um, uh, athletes with um, uh, DSD, such as uh, Duty Chand and uh, Casta Semenya. There's also the issue of uh, of uh, para sports and para athletes, and and uh, the, the categorisation around uh, uh, athletes uh, with disabilities, uh, where everyone's uh, uh, everyone with a disability, their ability levels are different, even though they may be categorised. Uh, as having the same, uh, the the same or within the the same category, um, so that there's also an issue uh, an issue there with the or tension there with the inclusion of para athletes uh, and uh, and uh, levels of fairness. Um, so uh, in terms of transgender athletes, uh, we not only see issues of uh, inclusion, uh, uh, tension between inclusion and fairness with trans women. We also see that uh, that tension uh, with uh, trans men. Uh, so the the picture there is of a trans uh, male, a trans man wrestler, uh, uh, Mac Beggs uh, from Texas, who um, who transitioned during high school uh, and um, uh, was uh, a high school wrestler. Um, uh, Mac. Um, uh, due to the laws uh, in the state of Texas, uh, was forced to uh, forced to compete uh, in the um, uh, category assigned uh, at birth, his uh, uh, sex, not his uh, gender. Uh, and um, so you have the situation where you have a trans man competing in wrestling uh, against uh, cisgender women athletes. So Meg. Uh, uh, Mac went two years undefeated. Um, so we uh, we see that this tension not only exists with trans women, but due to certain laws or certain perceptions of lawmakers and others, uh, the uh, this uh, issue raises itself with trans men as well. And I'd, at this point, I'd like to to pose uh, pose the question um, at the moment. Um, uh, testosterone uh, isn't limited for male athletes. So what happens when we get to the point where a trans man starts to beat cisgender men? Does that change? Will, will we st uh, start having the, the same arguments that we're having at the moment with trans women? It's just a, a, a question uh, to ponder. Um, in the middle of there, of course, we have a, uh, a photo of uh, Duty Chand, uh, who is a, an a athlete uh, with uh, a, a disease of sexual difference, a DSD, uh, and um, uh, her case was the first to go to CAS in terms of um, the original testosterone uh, limit for athletes with DSD, uh, a case that she won. Um, but we also, uh, the issues of athletes with DSD are different to the issues of, of trans women. Athletes with DSD have naturally higher levels of testosterone. So the question then is, do we treat that as, um, uh, as uh, a natural competitive advantage uh, that uh, those athletes have? And of course, I've, I've gone through the, um, uh, the, the issues with with para athletes, but the photo there we have a single a single amputee um, uh, athletics athlete. Um, uh, in some categorizations within athletics, we have single uh, single leg um, uh, athletes uh, competing against double amputees. 
Um, and those double amputee athletes, of course, have a competitive advantage uh, because they are, uh, they are running with uh, two blades and not one. Um, if you could just uh, change the slide for me, Catherine. Um, so the, the approach that I take, I, I'm a pretty uh, optimistic uh, person. Um, and um, uh, the, uh, within the philosophy of sport, there's a, the school of uh, thought called broad internalism uh, or interpretivism. Uh, and, and that school basically says that uh, we have uh, that sport has a set of uh, a sport has a set of rules. Now, rules are written in the English language. They're, the language itself is imperfect, but also rules can't be written um, uh, can't be written uh, to cover every situation that occurs in in a sport. Uh, and and so within this this school, we see that that there are a set of values that sport represents, which sit. Uh, sit next to those rules through which those rules can be can be interpreted, especially when rare situations occur where the where the rules either don't fit the situation or need to be interpreted uh, in, in order for for an out, outcome to um, uh, to be what it, what is best for sport. Now, um, uh, I'm about to use an analogy from uh, from one of the academics on the Macy program. Uh, John William Devine about the chair. Um, and I apologize to him now because I'm probably going to butcher it. Um, but um, uh, everyone knows a chair has certain aspects, uh, certain attributes that make it a chair. So it's got a back, it's got a seat, it's got legs uh, and the like. But if you all close your eyes and imagine what the perfect chair is, we'll, also, we'll all come up with something slightly different. But it's, the, it's that perfect chair those those attributes that make it perfect that's analogous to those values that make sport perfect uh, and and we all strive to bring sport to a place where it's in its most perfect form uh, we we always have a long way to go but 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 we we see sport uh, in in that way and that brings me to uh, JS Russell uh, who wrote a very interesting uh, article uh, and is uh, one of uh, one of the lead authors in this area, uh, entitled "Are Rules All an Umpire Has to Work With?" and and Matt Matt will be able to um, uh, sympathise here. Uh, J.S. Russell was a baseball fan, uh, and he recognised there are a number of situations that occurred in in the history of baseball that that required an umpire to interpret rules in a, in a way that espoused certain values of sport and he identified four of them so excellence fairness fair play competitive balance and good conduct but he also posed the question are there other values uh, and i i would see um uh, see inclusion uh, as one of those values so then we get the, the question which my phd would want to ask is how do you balance those values what do you do when uh, when two of those values are in conflict or tension uh, and so that the, the first half of, of my PhD is, is going through and answering that question. Um, if we could have the next slide, please, Catherine. There's basic structure of, of the PhD. We start with inclusion and fairness um, as internal values, um, which leads to tension. Then we uh, move through uh, issues with trans athletes, athletes with DSD, parasports, which I've also uh, already uh, gone through. But we also have issues with the Court of Arbitration for Sport, which have arisen when they were dealing with issues of inclusion, such as the Duty Chant case and the Casta Semenya case. Um, I believe uh, it was um, uh, Sylvia Camparese who, uh, who raised the issue Or, 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 um, uh, or uh, uh, didn't uh, put any value to the e the uh, ethical arguments um, uh, and the social cultural arguments um, uh, for uh, for uh, Duty Chand and Casta Semenya uh, and against the um, the blanket rules in in place which cover cover them so that that raises the issue of is the court for arbit arbitration for sport 
um, it doesn't have the ability to be able to deal with issues or ethical dilemmas such as this, or should we just uh, take those take those to another forum or reform CAS so that they so that CAS actually has the ability to be able to uh, deal with those uh, deal with those issues. Um, if I could have the next slide, please, Catherine. Uh, and I know I'm running out of time, but as you can see there, there's some um, the the final step is applying that 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 philosophical and ethical framework to the dilemmas um, uh, which uh, which have arisen which I have gone through. Um, thanks for that. I believe I'm handing back to Catherine now. Yep. Thank you so much, Damien. Um, I just wanted to wrap up at the end and, and give people the opportunity to ask some questions and have a discussion to work out where to from here. Um, my perspective that I've been taking in the um, sport integrity space and the Restoring Trust in Sport um, book that that I mentioned, and, and Matt was also one of the wonderful contributing authors, um, was to take an ethics of care perspective and to start from a position as an ethical leader of inclusion. So I, was, I have taken the perspective for transgender athletes that morally it's the right thing to do. Um, sport is about fun and friendship first and about inclusion and community building and supporting those most vulnerable in our community. And the ethics of care approach is where we provide more care for those who need it most. And transgender athletes are clearly in that category. In terms of an integrity risk profile, as I mentioned at the beginning, vulnerabilities can be exploited and that's a risk for sports and we need to be mindful of that. But we also need to be mindful that a lot of work and struggle has gone into having the right for women to play sport at all. And we need to balance the perspectives of women who are also strongly of the view that the binary sport model is important to protect because it allows women to play sport where they wouldn't otherwise get an opportunity to. So I'm wondering then, and, and I invite anybody to, to comment on this, is where to from here? And I know that uh, this is an opportunity for Adele to think a little bit about the roller derby space, because of course, perhaps that's the future where we have more inclusive sports and that we allow people to uh, play sport um, identifying with the gender of their choice as they do in roller derby. So over to you. Um, can I just jump in there, uh, uh, Catherine? Um, there was one thing that you flagged that I did neglect to mention, and I just wanted to pose the, the, pose the question to everyone. Can trans women win? Uh, and I asked this question in, uh, in, in light of uh, Laurel Hubbard's uh, inclusion uh, in the New Zealand weightlifting team uh, and to compete at the Tokyo Olympics. Um, Laurel is not the number one ranked uh, weightlifter in the world. Um, she has not always won. She has not always dominated the her category of of women's uh, weightlifting. But the moment that we have a trans woman who wins something, we then start having the conversation about uh, about that athlete being excluded or changing the rules to uh, make it harder for a trans woman potentially to win. So uh, at, at what, uh, so then it comes back to the question, can trans women actually win? Um, they might That's be exactly able, right, I think, yeah. because um, the, the comparison point might be in swimming and say, well, Michael Phelps, his wingspan was so large that that enabled him to dominate the sport of swimming and Ian Thorpe's feet were so large as he was able to dominate swimming because he had these natural paddles should we have excluded both of them because they were too good and they had natural advantages and then you can think about other athlete natural advantages where they're double jointed in baseball say um, Matt I that's an advantage um, for when you're pitching so should we exclude all double jointed athletes from gymnastics, for example, is that that's too big a, an advantage, isn't it? 
hemoglobin in blood, you know, in, in athletics and sport. Uh, and I think to, um, to Damien's point, you can see how governing bodies uh, can react in that situation with Chand and Semenya. And, and you know, through the, the, the change in, in, in rules and essentially exclusion and then um, coming to Damien's point on, on uh, Court of Arbitration for Sport, essentially saying, well, it's discriminatory what's taken place, but it's uh, it's permitted because of uh, competitive balance and competitive advantage regulation. I, one question I wanted to well, raise, but I don't think it's one that we can answer now, but I think it's an important one for everybody to ask themselves, but particularly in the sport context is what is at stake in in holding firm to these gender binaries for ourselves as people, as women? Um, you know, what 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 is it that we hold so like, I guess, dear or that we are feeling, or not maybe we, because some people don't, but to, to really explore that question philosophically, like what, what is at stake? If we do have a more inclusive sport, what do we lose? Um, and I think that's important to, for people to ask themselves, you know. But uh, I mean, in roller derby, the whole, uh, we're well, not everybody, there, there are of course kind of different perspectives, but I think that as a whole, they've embraced kind of gender fluidity as a concept as a, as a sport, you know, that inclusion is actually at the top, even though they are about winning, you'll see them actively engaging with their community, trying to do better all the time, you know, so they want to win. So they're putting in place pathways and, and co competitive uh, things like, I don't know, rankings and things like that. But in, but while they do that, they also prioritizing inclusion and diversity. And I think it's not easy. It takes a lot of talking through and working through and, and it's things are slow because of that, but it's worth it because it provides space. And I think particularly now for uh, younger people where there's no sport options. So now you know, we're having a lot more young people coming out as non-binary, for example. And so where do they play sport if they're 14, 15 years old? I mean, one of my, uh, you know, my son's friends is, uh, nine years old so do, can they play sport and roller derby is providing that in other states but i don't think there would be many sports um, yeah but for I, I just put a link in there uh, just about an article that i wrote with a couple of colleagues where we actually talk about um kind of loss so felon the mma fighter there's a great article in communication and sport about how um her loss did something really productive because they were saying she's too good as a trans woman you know she's going to beat everyone she's too good she shouldn't be allowed to fight and then she lost so what do you say then um but anyway i'll go to the to the uh question so simone has one there and i think that that's um a great question and so she simone would you like to ask your question sure <laughs> um Thank you very much for your presentation. It's very detailed and, and very helpful, I think, in setting out some of the key aspects of, of dilemmas and helping people kind of think through what some of the assumptions are that many of the decision-making processes are based on. And I think that is the challenge for sport at all levels is to unpack these assumptions and ways of thinking that have become so entrenched and normalised. So to that point, um, I'm really interested in your thoughts on this whole question of the socio-cultural environment that shapes gendered bodies in sport and therefore shapes the governance and regulation of the decision-making and policy processes that you talked about in great detail. So what are the implications for people making decisions about gendered bodies in sport when we don't really know what the composition of those decision-making bodies is and what kind of knowledge or expertise they bring to those decisions. Given the history that we've talked about in terms of cisgender sport um, or women's sport and the bodies are becoming and changing all the time. So yet we have very conservative processes 
So I'm concerned that sports science comes to dominate this space and, and what are the implications of that if we ignore the body in its broader sociocultural, legal, human rights, broader context? Yeah, I, I'll start. <laughs> um, I, I think you've, you've hit the nail on their, their head to start off with. I think a lot of the conversation about, uh, about gender and sport and especially related to, to tra transgender people um, is all based around the the sciences, the biological sciences, and uh, and it, all of the decisions appear to be made based on on these sciences. Now, if you dig a little bit deeper into those sciences, you see that that they've done a study of twenty uh, university students where they've fed them testosterone blockers for for six months, and then they've measured the cross section of a certain muscle, and then they've made the giant leap when they get the results back to say that trans women have an advantage in sport. Um, and that's where a lot of the conversation comes in. Now, the second, the, the second point to make is, um, and with reference to the uh, AFL policy, you have the situation where if you were to stand a cisgender woman and a transgender woman next to each other, and they were the same height, the same weight, they had the same bench press and they had the same uh, data collected for all the other things that that Matt went through. One of those uh, one of those people doesn't have to prove themselves. They're automatically included, whereas the other one has to submit themselves to a to a, a committee process where you don't know who the people are on the committee. Uh, you don't know what their expertise is. You don't know why they're measuring these things. Um, and that in itself doesn't sit with me very well in terms of, of fairness. But then you also have, if you stand two trans women next to each other, one of them with the same statistics of Hannah Mouncey, but the other one, five foot seven, 50 kilos, uh, and uh, all, all of those other, uh, other statistics, one of those women will be included and one won't. So I, I also have significant, uh, significant issues there. Um, so we've got different bodies being treated differently. Um, and I always come back to, and one of the things I didn't mention was there's a, a Norwegian academic, Sigmund Lowland, uh, who wrote his, his uh, PhD uh, entitled Fair Play in Sport, a Moral Norm System, where he goes through um, this, this issue of what is fair and what is fair play. Uh, and he, is, he, he comes up with, uh, with this equation that, that states relatively equal cases should be treated relatively equally. Unequal cases can be treated unequally, but the level of that unequal treatment should be relative. Uh, now, I, uh, the, the question always then comes back to what is relatively equal? Uh, and this is where the distinction, uh, the, this is where I separate the conversation about transgender rule and whether or not the transgender rule is right, at the moment we have a uh, we have a rule for the inclusion of trans women. So in 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 my terms, that would make if if a trans woman was to meet those requirements, that would make uh, her a relatively equal case to a cisgender woman. Uh, uh, yeah, to a cisgender woman, uh, and so those two cases should be treated relatively equally. Uh, but we have a situation in sport where they're not. So I, I I would see that that as uh, as uh, as a, a breach of that fairness, uh, fairness norm and a, and and a breach of that value that uh, value in sport of fairness and fair play. So I hope I, that answers your question in in part. <laughs> could I jump in from what Damien said just briefly? More of a comment in terms of um, comparative law and, and comparative sport. Um, my background is in Japanese law and um, uh, and I've got some friends that I think would be interested in in doing some comparative research in this area. I'll only speak on Japan because that's what I know best, but I think what you've raised, um, Simone, raises interesting questions when you're looking at a, a global governance of this issue and you know, does your right as a transgender woman or a gender diverse uh, uh, person in Australia, is that different to what you're going to have in Japan? Because in Japan, socially and culturally, it's a very different approach to uh, what is a man and what is a woman. 
um, and, and, and very traditional in, in some parts of society. But in terms of uh, sport as well, there's a focus not on, uh, on strength and physique. So like, for example, in baseball, it's more skill orientated and just practicing to the point where, you know, you get sick or you die or you get injured. So there's a big difference there in, in, in Japanese sport that it's, it, it's skill orientated. And for example, in baseball, the foreign players that tend to play in Japanese baseball are big, strong guys that can hit a lot of home runs because the Japanese players don't do that. So that's where they get their power production from. So you can see like applying the AFL policy of physique and strength in Japan it is not really going to work because that's not the focus there. You know, uh, it, it's, it, it's very different. So that, that was the only thing that I thought of with your question. I can just do my quick response because of time. Um, I think that's an excellent point. And it's actually, I think you're speaking to the lack of cultural diversity and the whiteness of the AFL decision in Australia. Mm -hmm. Indigenous histories, uh, queer histories, multicultural histories. We, you know, that is part of Australian culture and not acknowledging that and the colonial history and impact on the way in which we see sporting bodies um, is a, a real concern when we think about the intersection with uh, gender and sexuality. So thank you. Can I just jump in? There's a really good question here from Lisa Hunter uh, in terms of um, fairness. And, and I agree, fair to whom? Um, so there's, there's a, a, an author, uh, Miriam Sedai, who, who um, saw fairness uh, as a construction. So, uh, and fairness can be constructed in, in a multitude of ways. Uh, and at the moment, we're con uh, constructing fair, uh, fairness individually from our own perceptions. Um, and uh, when, when we try to reconstruct uh, fairness, um, uh, fairness as a, as a uh, concept, what we're actually doing is we're taking power away from one group and allocating it to another. And the situation that we have with cisgender women and trans women is you've got one, uh, one group of, of athletes uh, who have been uh, marginalized in the history of sport. And we're trans we're, there's the potential to transfer power to another group of, of women uh, who are, um, who are currently being marginalised in sport, and I, I'm, this is this is one of the the the, the first uh, ethical dilemma that has come up, which has uh, has um, uh, seen this historically marginalised group um, being uh, being asked to cede some of its power to another group. Uh, of uh, another group of women, and 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 uh, I think that's uh, that's a place where some of this tension can uh, it can arise. And, and Damien, that, that did arise in the AFLW uh, in twenty seventeen or twenty eighteen. Uh, uh, Daisy Pierce, who's one of the highest profile AFLW players at Melbourne, was on the AFLPA uh, board and basically said the transgender women should not be involved and Hannah Mounty should not play AFL W uh, and, and you know this is a leader in in the sport um, and, and on the and I think this is talking to people like Brendan Schwab who is heavily involved in uh, the player union movement you know he, he said to me that one of the key things that has to be done is education of of players um, and, and that that and, and I think that you get a different dynamic from community sport to elite sport because you do have player associations involved. Um, and, and I think Brendan's made a, a really important point that he pushes to, to player associations and, and to uh, female uh, professional athletes is that you can't pick and choose which rights you want to uh, protect and, and put on at a higher level. Because once you, you do that, you're giving the opportunity to governing bodies sports governing bodies like the AFL then to target other things that you you, you may hold uh, valuable so I think education of, of athletes is, is really uh, is really important in this regard uh, and particularly when you when you have a player association and you start to engage with labor law and union uh, rights and these sorts of things it, it, I think it just changes the dynamic a little bit.
Uh, we might just see if there's any final questions before we wrap up. I think we could talk about this for a long time. Um, <laughs> but I just think, yeah, this is such a great resource um, for people. You know, you, you, thank you so much for providing such a great, you know, it's very detailed, but also, you know, kind of very clear. So did anyone have any questions or comments before we uh, finish up? I just wanted to refer everyone to the chat because Michael Burke has made a number of really interesting mm -hmm. observations and um, we didn't get to talk about world rugby today. I'm sorry, Michael, but thank you very much for referring to that. We're, um, that's perhaps a whole seminar for another day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it, Michael actually wraps up the, the discussion and the decision-making process of, of uh, world rugby, uh, rugby quite succinctly uh, in, yeah. in, in that they, they did put primacy to the, the scientific data that they received uh, and I've seen a lot of discussion online in terms of that scientific data and the process that that uh, world rugby uh, went through and I think it's I, I think it's it, it, it's um, um, sh shows what um, uh, rugby bodies actually think of that process when you have uh, most of the major uh, major mm. uh, rugby federations uh, simply ignoring uh, that directive and including trans women uh, in their sport. Yeah. Um, there's just, yeah, so much to <laughs> say. I'm glad that people enjoyed it. Just quickly, uh, we have another seminar coming up um, in August. Where is my share screen? I, I can never find my button when I need it. Um, where is it? Sorry, oh, here it is. Okay, so we just um. So we have uh, August uh, the twenty sixth at ten a.m. Professor Alison Pullen from Macquarie University, who's a great um, organizational studies scholar and gender scholar, who's done some really interesting work in sport, which will be great to see everybody there and learn more. Um, so I just want to thank Catherine, Damien and Matt. That's, it's been really wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. And thanks everyone for coming. Yeah. Thanks everyone. Thank you.